Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. This is Iron Radio. I'm Phil Stevens. I am a strength coach, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete, and football coach. Nice. This is Dr. Mike Nelson, associate professor at the Kerrigan Institute, creator of the Flex Diet Cert and the Fizz Flex Cert, and still down here in South Padre, Texas. This is Coach Durrell. I'm the Strength Guild uh, coach and gym owner in Kansas City. I work with well, all kinds of people. Young people right now are taking over my gym for the most part. Wow. All right. And I am Lonnie Lowry. I've been a professor for about 25 years. I consult for the food industry and now academia as well. Uh, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And today we have Jose Antonio. Glad to have you on. Hey, thank you. Um, brief introduction. I'm, uh, my name is Jose Antonio. I'm a professor at Nova Southeastern University in South Florida. And I am the CEO of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. So glad to be on the show. Cool. How long have you been a, a prof, Joey? Has it been uh, since mid nineties? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it kind of depends. I mean, believe it or not, when I was in grad school, this is uh, at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Um, I made it a point to teach as many places as possible. So I probably was adjunct faculty. This is late eighties, early nineties at every community college in Dallas. And then a few four year schools like Texas Christian University, uh, University of Dallas. So you could say technically I've been a professor, at least adjunct, um, since God, it's been what four, it's been thirty something years. Holy shit! Wow. Years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. damn, yeah. <laughs> long time, long time. Well, that obviously wasn't enough for you. So then you started the ISSN, <laughs> and longtime listeners, of course, know about the International Society of Sports Nutrition. But when did that start, and why did you do that? Yeah, that was, it was almost, uh, accidental. I mean, I, I sort of refer myself as an accidental CEO because to be honest, I did not want to do it because it's a lot of work. Um, you lose a lot of money, especially at the beginning, you lose a lot of money, but it really stemmed. And you're familiar with this. If you go back to the 1990s and even before that, it stemmed from a very anti supplement position that most, if not all academic nonprofits took. So ACSM. Yeah. Uh, American Dietetic Association, of course, they rebranded their name, thinks we would be more scientific, but we know that's not true. Um, <laughs> so the yeah. NSCA was, oddly enough, the only organization that was pro-supplement, and it was only because it was mostly guys who lifted weights who took supplements. So they're all like, yeah, we love supplements, but ACSM was might have been the worst. Um, so <laughs> the way it sort of started was um, um, Doug Howman, who you all know, he organized – a workshop, which I believe you spoke at, at SCAN, which is an offshoot of the, at the time, American Dietetic Association. So it was like mm -hmm. a subgroup. Mm -hmm. And it was funny. It was like, wait a minute. All the people speaking, none of them are really dietitians. They're all exercise physiologists. And after that, a <laughs> funny thing happened. I tried to join SCAN, and they told me to F off because I'm not a dietitian, which I thought was really kind of funny because they wanted me to speak. <laughs> kind of insular. <laughs> I'm like, you're not a dietitian, you can't join. I'm like, you don't want my money? I'm like, I'll give you money. I just want to network. I mean, that's all I cared about. I just want to network. And they're like, nah, you're not a dietitian, so bye-bye. I was like, okay, that's really that's really weird and parochial. And then, uh, no and, yeah. and then at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting, after a talk that Jeff Stout and I gave, Jeff is now at the University of Central Florida, uh, the president of ACSM, you know her, Priscilla Clarkson, you know, God rest her soul. Uh, she came up to both Jeff Stout and I and said, if you want to have a career, don't do research in supplements. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I'm like, did, I looked at Jeff, I'm like, did she say don't do research? And Jeff's like, uh, I think that's exactly what she said. And so, <laughs> because Jeff and I, you know, we, we were like little sheep, we decided to take her advice. And we left academia to work in the supplement industry. So, <laughs> so during that time in the supplement industry, I mean, the reason I left is one, I wanted to move to Florida because I love hot weather. You know, I know Lonnie, you're not a fan of, you know, 
boiling to death in the summer, but right. I kind of like it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, left academia. I wanted, to leave, I wanted to live in Florida, so we worked in the supplement industry really hardcore for about two years. Um, and then during that time, we came up with this idea, myself, Doug Kalman, Rick Ryder, uh, Susan Kleiner, that maybe we should just start our own organization, and this was back in the early 2000s. And basically, Doug and I took it by, you know, took the bull by the horns, and we said, you know what, we'll organize it. And to be honest, Lonnie, I had no freaking clue what I was doing. Neither did Doug. We're like, hey, how do you do this? I'm like, I don't know. But we'll just figure it out, and, you know, along the way. So mm-hmm. long story short, our first conference was 2003. We've had 20 conferences. And so in, the, in those two decades, and it's hard to believe it's been two decades, we, I think, at least part of what ISSN has done is it has legitimized research in the sports supplement field. Prior to the year 2000, and you know this when you were doing your PhD, I actually loved sports nutrition way back when, but I knew I could not do it as part of a dissertation because nobody would touch it. Um, And so that's why I did the muscle physiology stuff for my PhD. But, you know, before the year 2000, it was like nobody paid credence to it. It was an illegitimate field. And now it's funny. In year 2023, every major university has a sports nutrition course. Some have multiple sports nutrition courses, which is like, wow, in 20 years, it went from uh, this field sucks to like, wow, we all need a sports nutrition course because it's so damn cool. Right. right. So I always I tell people, hey, you know, what? you might lose a few battles, but at the end you win the war. So, you know, not that we were trying to win the war, but it's like, you know what? When I speak to Doug and Jeff, I'm like, you know, all that shit we got earlier. It's like, hey. I know they'll never admit they were wrong, but they know they were wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, Joey, yeah. the, I, I remember we were uh, at the Mike Nelson, Mike here, and I were, we were in Japan at the yeah. uh, Noodles Museum, International Noodles Museum or whatever, and there's, their owner is you know big-time entrepreneur, and he said the basic rule of entrepreneurship, find a need and fill it. And that's sort of what you did, right? I mean, it, you didn't seek to do that, but you're like, there's this huge gap being telling a PhD, telling a scientist, don't do research is oh, blast right. like like wait, we, like the monkey images with the you know hand over your eyes and mouth and ears. That's contrary to science, and yet yeah, that was the landscape. And I think a lot of younger people that listen to the show, I don't I don't want to go into curmudgeon mode, but yeah, um, the beginnings of this were, were um, rocky at best. Lots of controversy, lots of you know, fighting back and forth between organizations or individuals. And it was just, it was just a real challenge. But to your point about legitimacy, it was early 2000s. It might've been like, oh, six, oh, seven. Uh, I was teaching in a dietetics department and that was when the ADA at the time, now the A-N-D, you're right. Now, now it's the Academy, uh, <laughs> but they um, mandated a sports nutrition class. So oh, wow. and that was a niche for me, right? So there, there was a very real outgrowth. You guys will laugh about this, but in exercise phys, of course, we have a poke and prod each other model, like this lab learn by doing, you know, yeah. your hands on human beings in real lab critical thinking experiences. And I did that. And the dietitians I worked with thought that was absolutely absurd. And I'm like, well, that's how I do it. That's how I roll. The students like it. You know, I got a little bit of grant funding. I got a metabolic car, some backbone things. Uh, because if you're going to teach sports nutrition, you're going to have to go actually collect, you know, observe and record data. Um, wait, wait, wait. Why did you think that was absurd? I, I, that's the part I'm not getting. Well, because I think uh, when you're very clinically oriented or food service oriented, you're much more geared toward field experiences. Just go shadow under this, you know, essentially like manager of a food system, like lunch lady type stuff, you know, to a uh, <laughs> to a physiologist <laughs> uh, or clinical experiences. Go spend time whether it's in a hospital setting or like a WIC, you know, community setting. And it's more of a shadowing kind of thing for the most part. Like, for example, they would prepare posters. And I remember once the department head said, oh, I got to whip up a poster this afternoon for the state meeting or whatever. And I'm like, well, I didn't know you've been collecting data. She goes, I'm not going to collect any data. What are you talking about? I'm just going to put some opinions on a poster. And, you know, there it is. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Or trying to explain inferential statistics. And they're like, oh, so you need more subjects. I'm like, no, no. It's like a signal to noise ratio. I'm trying to explain (laughs) effect size or I'm trying to explain things. And the ultimate conclusion was, oh, so you need more subjects. I'm like, you know what? Forget it. Um, It makes me very concerned that we have a lot of evidence-based practice fields, allied health fields, and they can't really read evidence. 
uh, they don't get enough right to understand research design and stats and that kind of stuff. So hopefully a lot of that has changed since the you know, early 2000s, or maybe that was a single exemplar. I doubt it. Anyway, not I, to going. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's changed. That's the sad part. Um, because I know a lot of, uh, I know several students who got their undergrad degree in exercise science and decided to go master's in dietetics. And before I said, okay, before you do this, I'm like, you know, do what you want. If you think this is the best thing, there will be things they will teach you that you're going to have to unlearn because it's just not true. And <laughs> it's a different course, perspective like, well, for sure. <laughs> right. And so on occasion, I would get these, these screenshots. They're like, you're not going to believe what they're telling us in class and I'm reading the screenshots. I'm like, I believe you because I saw this 30 years ago, but I, in a weird way, I can't believe they're still teaching this stuff. So it's, the, you know, I'll ask them, so what did you actually learn in those two years? And a lot of them will say, I kind of didn't learn anything in terms of physiology. I'm like the food service stuff. I don't give a shit how, you know, what a serving of mashed potatoes is when you're at a fucking buffet line. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's 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 weird how there's this weird there's a, a culture, and I hate to say it, there's a culture within the field of dietetics that is, in a weird, it's it's kind of anti science, and it's it's just puzzling. I, I'm like, okay, well, I guess if, <laughs> it's sort of like this. Um, I feel like people who do research in the sports supplement or sports nutrition field, I'd say we number in maybe the few hundred. Maybe there's two hundred of us in the world, like in the world. Compare that to, and you would know these numbers better than me, Lonnie. How many dietitians are there? I don't know, 90,000? Over 100,000? Yeah, over 100. Yes. <laughs> so I always say, well, it's sort of like the movie 300. We're like 300, and, you know, the Persians are coming. I'm like, That's funny. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get the first 20, but after that, I'm done. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of funny because I use I use those kinds of bizarre antiquated things as as a way to teach my students i'm like hey look what this person said i want you to provide evidence either support or refute what this person said and it's great it's like because it's so easy to find this stuff online it's like you're not going to believe what this person said i was like oh my god let's well let's see if he or she is right so um but yeah it's uh, it's you know i used to get frustrated by it now i just use it it's like comedy i'm like oh that's kind of funny okay well <laughs> and and i use and i use instagram and twitter i'm like well there's a lot of funny people online and i mean you know i'm being pulled up here. Sure, tongue sure. in cheek but but you know we all laugh about it. it's like well that's really funny i can't believe they believe this stuff so right. so yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> uh well w- Everybody, we're going to talk in the, the second half after the break specifically about some of the, you know, the myths and some of the bad information that cir- circulates the Internet, at least on two things. We're going to really kind of double down on creatine and caffeine, I think, because uh, cool. because, yeah, Ho- Jose has been uh, looking into that kind of stuff, specifically trying to educate people. You know, one last thing is. It's interesting. You're talking about the historical underpinnings of this stuff. Uh we're all familiar with like the front of the like catch and McCardle ex vis book. They have that history of exercise physiology, like back all the way back into like the Harvard yeah. fatigue laboratory and, and work physiology and how it all began. It was very science timeline. And when yeah. I first started teaching in a dietetics department, I was exposed to a completely different nutrition timeline that was home ec based, uh, oh. home economics were, were the roots. And it all kind of started huh. with that. And I'm like, that's, you know, there's obviously more than one parallel timeline at work here, right? <laughs> like I'm from the scientific yeah. timeline. I'm not. I wasn't even aware of the home ec, family studies. You know, um, dietitians back in the day. You see these old black and white pictures of people in these kind of you know uh, clinical looking garb, very dated looking things. And wow, like it, it was kind of fast tracked toward profession, whereas exercise phys was always historically more about research than early stage trying to turn it into a profession per se, you know? Interesting. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that either. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I, if you like to look up stuff online, look up some of that stuff. Like, and I don't doubt that that is also a parallel history, but that is not how I got into it. That's not what I was interested in. Uh, I had a very good, like urge to scientifically look at the world. And that's obviously there's a niche for that because of what you do with the ISSN, right? There, it's a right. legitimate field. A lot of journals like nutrients. I mean, 
a huge portion of their stuff is dietary supplement stuff now. And that just wasn't, yeah. yeah, that wasn't the case. I don't know if, how many young people remember that. One last thing though, before we go to break was, um, what about the, the strength and bodybuilding connection? So I've always thought of the ISSN as something that was strongly influenced in, I mean, you know, you go to conferences over the year, there's pro bodybuilders there and power lifters and that kind of stuff. How did that start? You know, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, I remember going to ACSM in the in the 1980s into the 90s, and then I sort of quit going for a while. But they had a very anti bodybuilding stance. It was really weird, and and it was, and I wasn't even a bodybuilder. That's why that's why I thought it was weird. I'm like, okay, everything is about aerobic training, which is great. But I recall a talk where a guy put a picture of a bodybuilder up there, literally just made fun of his physique and said. No one's ever died of having small muscles, you know, other than sarcopenia. Um, mm. But I thought this is a really weird anti-bodybuilding, anti-muscle hypertrophy view. Um, it was always aerobic this, aerobic that. And so th- that sort of stuck in my head, and everyone knew it. It's like everyone's like, oh, yeah, uh, AC Sun is very aerobically inclined. That's all they – they think that's the end-all, be-all. Um and that stuck with all of us because we know that in terms of the industry, it was bodybuilding that really pushed sports supplements. And as you, you and I know, I wrote, I wrote for a lot of these magazines in the, in the nineties and they were the biggest fans and proponents of ISSN. They're like, well, yeah, we've been talking about this shit for like 50 years. Uh, it's about time scientists sort of, you know, got on board and realized the importance of protein, et cetera, et cetera. And so, a lot of it, I'll, you know, you have to give the bodybuilding industry credit. A lot of them tried things that, you know, some worked, some didn't. I mean, I don't know about you, Lonnie, but I even tried Smilax, you know, those drops when I was, oh you, know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, this stuff's going to jack my testosterone. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I tried all of it. And, you know, there's some good stuff and the bad stuff. But at the end of the day, it's what sort of pushed People to look at the science because, as you know, my initial doctoral work was on muscle hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So, so I think people who were in the strength sports, not just bodybuilding, but powerlifting and whatnot, they were really the group that pushed the idea that there's something here that should be studied. And, and there's still a huge influence. And in a weird way, there's almost too much of an influence in, in ISSN because almost all of the sports nutrition advice comes from a physique standpoint, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, most people don't bodybuild. Most people compete in the sport. So in a way, it's like, hey, let's talk about sports because most people don't bodybuild, <laughs> but everyone loves the physique stuff. It's always physique this, physique that, lose fat, gain muscle, look pretty. I'm like, hey, all that's good, all that's good, but if you're a cyclist, you're that, you don't care about that stuff. You just want to win the race, you know. Right. If you're playing tennis, you want to have a stronger serve. You want to have a better backhand, forehand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I credit bodybuilding with a, with a lot of this. And in fact, when I did some of the high protein diet studies, there's only one group that's good at keeping track of their diet, and that's male bodybuilders. Everyone else, they suck at it. They <laughs> suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, even even the female bodybuilders, I'm like, you, I don't give a shit what you eat. Don't lie to me. Just tell me what you eat. But you know, male bodybuilders, they'll tell you exactly. You know, the volume of fluid, the grams of protein, the grams of carbs, because they're just really good at it and they're not ashamed. So, um, so I got to credit bodybuilding for a lot of this. Yeah. Hey, Phil. Um, I know you're on your phone here, but. You went to ISSN. Uh, you're a power lifter. I mean, I know power lifters, they also like to look huge, but I mean, it's a performance sport after all. What was your impression yeah. of the ISSN? I thought it was great. I mean, we did the show after it then. And uh, in my opinion, it was it was refreshing after going to the other bodybuilding type events. So when you start comparing it to Olympia and you know, oh, <laughs> or right. something like that, it was... It was refreshing for a, a, a meathead that has an interest in using his brain. So right. you actually go there and learn something. And and the talks were all over the place. I mean, so it, it was more than what I expected. So, yeah, because like you said, you, you, you expect this super clinical setting and, and whatnot. But uh, that was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what's interesting? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, a lot of the, and Lonnie, you know a lot of these professors, a lot of them, what got them interested was, Bodybuilding. I mean, you know, Jared Wilby's probably the largest yeah. scientist I've ever yeah. seen in my life. Indeed. And a lot of these, 
Yeah. A lot of them, they still lift. I mean, as they've gotten older, I think they changed their goals. But initially, it was bodybuilding that brought them into the sport, you know. I mean, brought them into the, you know, studying it scientifically. So, so I think that's a good thing because it provides a different perspective. Um, but, but yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, we try to provide the best science information, and, and some of it verifies what bodybuilders have done. Others, you know, maybe disprove some of what they've done, but at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to provide the best information. ISSN is kind of living proof of that, that there's a lot of men and women. They're interested in physique. They're interested in fat loss and performance and all this kind of stuff. And it is a legitimate thing to be interested in, not just direct clinical application, I guess. Um, but, Mike, what about you? What was your deal uh, early on as far as ISSN? Because you've been around for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I was looking around, you know, back in early 2000s, started going to conferences basically just for fun because I was interested in the topic, you know, started my first year of college, uh, six foot three, as Phil would say, an eel shaped break at like 156 pounds. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should do some lifting stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I remember going to, I think the first ice ascent I went to was it, gosh, 2008, maybe somewhere around there. And is that Vegas? Where was it? Yeah, I think it was Vegas. Um, and I was like, "Oh, this is crazy! Like these are nerds who left. This is pretty cool. Yeah. I haven't seen this before." <laughs> and it was actually more academic than I thought it was going to be, you know. And I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And then you find other people there. Obviously, I met Yulani at many conferences and many other people, and have you know presented a few times for the ISSN and helped out and. Yeah, it's just been been great, but I, you know, similar, you know, other than the NSCA, which I did my NSCA CSCS in 2006, I think, all the other organizations were still very cardio-based, and even some of the classes I was taking, like, you would ask a question about, you know, muscle hypertrophy, and the professor would look at you cross-eyed, like, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, just, mm -hmm. it wasn't part of the curriculum, and I'm like, well, this is like a a valid question it's a physiologic response obviously a lot of people have been doing it for hundreds of years you know but it was just wasn't really uh an accepted thing even Lonnie and I when we went to experimental biology years ago and the presenter put up a picture of Arnold and said well maybe some of you in the audience want to look like this and the whole audience went oh they were just like right in the gap. taboo like yeah totally in fact even now when you look at the literature uh I think to Joey's point you look at the literature and there's this sort of dirty accusation against bodybuilders. It'll be like, you know, supplements as abused by bodybuilders. I mean, you see it all the time, this sort of derogatory bias thing about these scary, vaguely derogative comments at bodybuilders and how they abuse themselves and how dangerous it is. And, you know, I'm not saying there's not some element to that. We've talked about that on the show over the years. There's lots of performance enhancing drugs. It's, it's more obvious, right? A huge muscle mass walking around at 280 pounds ripped is a much more obvious thing than blood doping and cycling. You know, you look at someone like Lance Armstrong and eh, I don't know, he looks like a dude. He's in, he fit, I guess, but it's not as obvious. But yeah, even now in the scientific literature, it's just rife with these derogatory comments about bodybuilders and abuse. Um, I'm working on actually a book of dietary supplements and what works and what does it right now and that kind of stuff. And uh, I keep coming across it, you know, in all different types of supplements. It's like, I don't know. This just sounds kind of discriminatory to me, but it's because it is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's in, it's entrenched in the, in the literature, you know, like, you know, dirty bodybuilders kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> hey, wait, well, we know cyclists, are the most doped up athletes of all. Oh time. yeah. Oh yeah. They take everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh Mike and I met, I think it was in Vegas. There was a sp specific cyclist. He's semi pro. I won't use his name and he was just running down a list of, of very <laughs> very scary things that he did. And I'm like, "Oh my god. Like I've never known anybody, even jack guys in the local, you know, local bodybuilding scene who used that would even touch half of what you're saying, man. I can't believe what you're telling me. But yeah, that was eye-opening. You're right. Absolutely. There's different uh, sports that are just rife with it. Uh, and you don't see that in the scientific literature as much because it's not as easy to make someone like that a poster child for you know, um, drug use because they're not as dramatic looking. Anyway, 
You have to get up exactly. at two in the morning to go for a ride because your blood is a consistency of yogurt. Like you're you're pushing the red line, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Oh yeah, tales of insulin uh, abuse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, EPO. Go down the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh all right, let's go to break. We're about halfway through, and then we come back. We're going to talk about uh, creatine and caffeine. Hey everybody, Iron Radio is back, and in an expanded way. What can you expect? Well, first, you can get it simulcast every week on the NutritionRadio.org network, as well as on the original podcast. It'll appear regularly on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. We have a new Iron Radio slash Nutrition Radio Facebook page as well. Please check us out. We're even backed up on YouTube. Second, Please tell your friends who are longtime loyal listeners that they may see emails that share just the episode link and the show notes. This is a new thing, and we hope it will build community. Third, if you are a supporting member in the past, we may prompt you to resume through PayPal, but we will confirm each and every donor before reinstating that membership category. We'll never just restart your $4 auto payments without agreement from you. And of course, we will accept new members moving forward as well. Starting back slowly and honorably is the goal. And lastly, expect the sister show, Nutrition Radio, to expand into once-weekly 45- to 60-minute episodes with guest co-hosts covering the same nerdy nutrition news that's been broadcast for a few months now in daily 10-minute clips. We hope that an expanded presence will get you the news, education, banter, and guests that's made Iron Radio's community so loyal from the start. You are appreciated. All right, everybody, we're back. So... It's Phil and Mike Jarrell, Lonnie, and we are interviewing Dr. Jose Antonio uh, of the International uh, Society of Sports Nutrition, longtime professor, uh, sports nutrition uh, legitimizer, <laughs> if, if you will. And, <laughs> I like that. And we're going to talk about two things uh, today that are really kind of prominent, one supplement and one arguably drug, um, drug slash supplement, and that's creatine and caffeine. So – uh, Joey, I know that you've worked on papers over the years specifically on like myth busting because there's so much crap around some of these things. Let's start with creatine, um, you know, like maybe the beginnings of that. And then what are the what are the myths that you feel like you needed to bust, if you will? Well, no, it's funny. This uh, this the timing of this is interesting because I uh, I will on occasion review articles written by different authors for Forbes Health. Um, you can find it online. So literally this week, um, there was an article called Bodybuilding Meal Plan, What to Eat and What to Avoid. It uh, looks like it's written by a DPT, a physical therapist named Rachel Tavel or Tavel. And so Forbes Health will send me, uh, they'll send me the document, the Microsoft Word document. They'll say, hey, give, give us your opinion, et cetera, et cetera. So some of it, it's like, okay, I'm not going to argue about what foods to eat. I don't, you know, I don't give a shit what you eat. But <laughs> I scroll down to the article, and I will, I will read you because it, it just got published. So this is what the author said. She recommends taking creatine monohydrate before or during workouts, but avoiding too high of a dose as it can lead to kidney stress and damage. Uh, <laughs> sorry. When I, <laughs> when so I reviewed this, I said... This is just patently wrong. I would recommend you just remove it. Did they remove it? No. So I'm like, holy shit, because on the article it shows I'm the, what does it call me? It calls me the, uh, uh, I am, it was medically reviewed by me as my picture, my name. I'm like, holy shit, they're going to think I'm an idiot, an idiot. So yeah. I post this on Twitter and I quote and I'm like, this is just patently not true. This is just incorrect. And <laughs> this guy's like, you're the medical editor. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't mean they took my advice. So right. this is the kind of stuff we deal with. Like in 2023, I'm like, why do people feel compelled? And I swear, you and I know, Alani, going way back, there's something about the kidneys that people love to beat on. You know? Oh, my God. <laughs> the kidneys. Protein hurts the kidneys. Everything hurts the kidneys. I'm like, no, 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 kid- no, no, no. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. So. This is probably one of the best examples, and you can ap- apply it to protein as well, where even today, despite the fact that there's no evidence that creatine or protein or whatever harms the kidneys, it's still being written. And I'm thinking, God, I hope people don't think I actually believe this stuff. 
Um, Cause there was other stuff that I commented on. I mean, you know, we argued back and forth about, you know, how much fluid should bodybuilders drink? I'm like, first of all, there's no, there's no randomized controlled trials on this. I mean, a lot of it is individualized. You can't really say, you know, bodybuilders need to consume like eight to 10 glasses of, you know, 14 ounces of water. No one, yeah. no one knows. It's just, you, you, you do it by trial and error. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to argue with you guys about that, but you can't say this about creatine. You can't say this about protein. So it, you know, they take what they like, they ignore the rest. And, I, you know, I, is there, is there a, uh, I guess my question to you guys, is there an agenda where you have to beat the shit of, out of creatine and or protein regarding the kidneys? And I'm thinking, what could that be? And I don't know what it is. Yeah. I'm like, this keeps going on. And I'm like, well, okay, well, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. So if you guys know, I would like to know. You know, one thing I thought about, and I, I think Mike and I must have talked about this over the years, but one thing I think is they, they conflate it with creatinine, you know, which is, yeah. of course, a, a, a oh. clearance marker for renal function. And it's like that's creatine, you know, not creatinine. We're missing an I in there. It's not the same thing. Yes, creatine can become <laughs> creatinine. I get it. But this is a simple physiology, like flux argument, rate of appearance versus rate of disappearance. It doesn't mean your kidneys are not filtering your blood. You know, people are supplementing it on the front end. Um, yeah, but I think it has a lot to do with that. But God, that's a good point. Protein, creatine, what is it about HCPs? They love to target the kidneys. Even when we get to caffeine in a little bit here, we're going to bring that up again in this case, in that situation with dehydration. Like, no, 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 no. Um, and yeah, yeah, I don't know. It seems to be the the bullseye for a lot of clinicians, yeah. you know. This renal function. I can tell, you, like with creatine, other than the kidney thing, which comes up all the time, I, I still have a hard time believing people think creatine is a steroid. Which, I'm like, what? Yeah. I mean, not that everyone's taken an organic chemistry class, but you could look up the structure of creatine and the structure of cholesterol. You know, the building block of all steroid molecules, and realize they don't even resemble each other. So that's that's probably one of the weirder ones, and it's. And, and and the other one, which, you know, I laugh about because, you know, Lonnie, you and I are hair challenged, is that it makes you bald. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> that was a new one for me. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, no. And it was based on one study which showed that, oh, if you look at dihydrotestosterone goes up, you know, and I think it was rugby players. And I said, but look at the data. Don't just read the abstract. They went from normal to normal. It was in like the normal range of THT. So, no, there's no evidence. Let's say DHT goes up within the normal range. There's no evidence that that translates into uh, more baldness. And also, if you look at the, the population that probably consumes the most fish in the world is Japan. They consume more fish per capita than anybody. It would mean that most of the people there should be bald, right? Especially the men. And mm. I don't see that. If, if anything, mm -hmm. I'm going to guess, I don't know the data, I would guess Asians as a group tend to not be as bald. But that's just my guess. I have no idea. <laughs> so. yeah. that's a good one about baldness i didn't actually hear about that until just a couple of years ago and i'm like what like <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> yeah you're right there's so many other factors people want to like point to one thing you know because everything in physiology is so multivariate right and it's like okay let's forget the fact that my dad went bald in his 30s and everything else let's just, <laughs> let's just <laughs> correlate lonnie's creatine intake with his chrome dome right yeah not <laughs> not valid <laughs> not valid <laughs> And there's water retention, you know, weight gain thing, um, which a lot of people think is bad. And you're like, well, it's intramuscular water. That can be good. And yeah, I, get, I don't even know all the different um, issues with creatine, but it's definitely gotten challenged over the years a lot. The steroid thing had me rolling my eyes. I think it was Rick Kreider was I read something. He was like kind of doubling down. Hey, guys, it's not <laughs> it's not a, a steroid. Who knows where this stuff comes from other than the whole bodybuilders are dirty thing. You know, bodybuilders use yeah. it. They're all steroid using guys. Uh, bad equals bad. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I think no. I think there's there's some truth to that because most people outside of bodybuilding or even outside of the exercise field view bodybuilding as as a dirty sport because of drug use. You know, because you know other athletes never use drugs, of course. Um, and and I think that's why there's this preconceived notion that if bodybuilders use it, there must be something wrong with it and Obviously, creatine is used by body, but, but creatine is also used by a lot of performance athletes. So um, I think it's a weird bias. 
I don't know how we get rid of it, but I mean, we're doing our best. <laughs> That's what right. I can say. We're doing our best. <laughs> well, honestly, Joey, the work that you've done, uh, a lot of people in the ISSN, it's very broad, you know, reaching, very far reaching now. But a lot of that work, I mean, it's harder and harder to demonize something like, oh, bodybuilders and creatine because creatine is used for so many things now, like yeah. clinically applicable, worthwhile things. I admit when creatine first came out, I think it was 92, there was an EAS grant that Pete Lemon got and, and we were working on this grant. And that's when I first met uh, Anthony Almada. Um, but at the time, I was very skeptical. I'm like – you can't just take a phosphagen and then it's just going to insert itself <laughs> in your energy pathways. I was skeptical, but you know, right, over the right. years as it came, as things data accumulates, a good scientist changes his conclusions with new evidence, you know? And I'm like, Oh my God, like this is actually doing what we wanted it to. This wasn't just a promise from Bill Phillips, <laughs> you know, <It> was, <laughs> <laughs> there was data, there were actual data. And now it's, it's used for so many things from, you know, brain health and TBI. And Mike, you've talked about that before. And yeah. I mean, um, not just muscular things, lots of things. We have partly the legitimacy of dietary supplements and the fact that, yes, bodybuilders do self-experiment on this kind of stuff. And But then, you know, there's a wealth of information that you can learn just from observational work on, you know, on that happening. And here, you know, 25, 30 years later, like, oh, my gosh, this stuff is very useful. We need to take a serious look at it, right? I mean, it's used yeah. clinically in all kinds of things. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I, I'm around a lot of endurance athletes only because my wife, she's uh, she's actually a national class cyclist. And I, I'm, a, I'm around a lot of the sort of national class, even world class stand-up paddlers. And so they all use creatine now. So mm -hmm. even in the endurance world, it's it, they're realizing, hey, there's a value to it. You might add some lean mass, which will help you in a sport where body weight is supported, even if it's endurance. Um, it can help with recovery. And the whole brain thing. I mean, I tell, you know, it's funny. My students, you know, I teach a sports nutrition course, and I, I always do a quick survey. Who here takes creatine? Out of maybe 30 students, there might be three, and it's almost always guys. And I say, look, even if you don't give a crap about gaining skeletal muscle mass, and most of you probably don't, take it for your brain, because it might actually help your brain. Um, and so I had this reputation at the university. It's like, oh, yeah, once you graduate from NOVA, if you've taken Dr. Antonio's class, he's going to make sure you're sucking down, you know, one gram per pound of protein and taking five grams of creatine a day. That's that's basically what you're going to learn from me because he hammers that point every day. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's, um, it's fun. Here on Iron Radio over the years, we've – you could tell, like – you know, back in the day, like in 2010, I was in the middle of competing. I mean, Phil, you competed so frequently your whole life. But I, I guess the point being is uh, the life changes. Like I still put a tablespoon of creatine in my coffee every morning uh, just because, oh. you know, reduce reduce risks of all kinds of things, you know, uh, degenerative, you know, neurodegenerative disease or uh, just anything I can do against inflammation or because I've been reading some stuff lately about the anti-catabolic and anti-inflammatory possibilities of creatine. I mean, they're really opening up this stuff. And so I'm doing it more for like a lifespan, maintain yeah. function, not fall apart kind of thing, cognition and muscle. You know? <laughs> hey, I can relate to the not fall apart kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've been taking, I take capsules, I can't do the powder, but I take about three to, roughly three to four grams a day going back to the 1990s. I've been doing that now for 30 years. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I do it for my brain. I'm like, God, I hope it helps my brain because my memory really sucks. I'll remember, you know, my wife's like, how can you remember like a football score from like 1976, but you don't remember what I asked you like three minutes ago. I'm like, it's just the way my brain works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it sounds damning. Yeah, from the wife perspective, you're not listening to me. I just told you that. I live, I live that too, my man. <laughs> uh, all right, we have just enough time to to tackle caffeine too. So, uh, uh, caffeine's regularly in the news. Uh, Mike, of course, you were part of the caffeine position paper since since you did co-author that, Mike. What? Um, and then we'll get to Joey's interest moving forward with this, you know, like myth busting kind of stuff. Um, what are some of the things that stood out for you? Yeah, the the biggest issue with all of it was there was actually too much data. 
like the original versions, Joey probably even saw them and he probably like smacked himself on the forehead and went, there's no way we can publish a, you know, hundred page <laughs> position <laughs> stand. Or like, you guys got to kind of narrow this down. And like, okay. And that was actually kind of hard because, you know, on those position stands, as you know, Lonnie did the one on coffee. You want to be inclusive because it is a position stand and you want to make sure you're getting the data, you know, accurately representative of what it is but you're not publishing an encyclopedia on it either, you know, so you have to kind of pick and choose what you want to publish. And I think for most people, they would probably be surprised that there is actually that much data. You could say the same thing with creatine. There's still this sort of perception, I think, that, oh, that this is the, the evil drug. We did, Yeah, it's been around for a while, but nah, no one really studies it that much. And um, as you guys all know, there's a ton of data on caffeine. And then, in what form, you know, is it in a gum? Is it in an energy drink? Is it in coffee? Is it in tea? And, you know, that, that to me, I think was probably more earth shattering news for most people out there, I would think. Yeah. So many forms and there's so much bad information. The oh, last yeah. time I, last time I went to the Red Cross, uh, I was told by the nurse there, she's like, you didn't have any coffee today, did you? That'll dehydrate you. <laughs> and I just, I just looked at her with a you, you guys would have been proud. I looked Read at her, I said, paper. all I said was, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and I just let her hang herself. And I said, okay, noted. <laughs> because you're not going to, when they get opinions like protein harms your yeah. kidneys or creatine hurts your kidneys or, or coffee or caffeine dehydrates you, you know, it's hard to disabuse them, right? They don't want to feel like they were wrong. Nobody wants to feel like they were bamboozled. Um, but caffeine, yeah, all the, you hear the one off, these singular yeah. random one off. So and so used some highly concentrated powder. Uh, they measured it in grams instead of milligrams and killed themselves. <laughs> you know, they had a right. heart attack or something. But yeah, so where did that uh, come from, Joey? Obviously, then other than the, you know, the fact that people everywhere all around the world love caffeine. The interest in like maybe uh you know common myths or misconceptions about caffeine you know that kind of stuff. Oh. Yeah, well, what's interesting is that uh, and Mike alluded to this. Probably the two supplements, I guess caffeine technically is a drug, but the two supplements that uh that have the most data are the ones that have the most myths surrounding it. So <laughs> mm-hmm. it's sort of like wait a minute, <laughs> we only have five hundred studies on this stuff. Do we really need more studies? And right. Apparently we do. So it's it's one of those things. So creatine and caffeine, and then protein would probably be the third one, which has so many you know myths and misconceptions, and and that's really the reason why we put together um, you know the position papers. Also uh, put together um, this idea actually comes from Darren Kando up in in Canada. Um, what we call common questions and misconceptions about. We did one with creatine. We're doing one with uh, uh, protein and caffeine. And we put it, we, we do it in a manner, we write it in a manner where we ask a question, like, for instance, does caffeine dehydrate you? And then we answer the question. That way, because let's face it, people are lazy readers. They're, they want to go to what they're interested in. So they'll go to that question, look at the answer. You know, like, for instance, is creatine a steroid? Well, they'll read the question like, okay, what's the data say? It's like in three or four paragraphs, we'll summarize the data. So I think those are the three big categories, caffeine, creatine, and protein, that have so many misconceptions despite the fact that they have the most data, which seems ironic. Um, yeah. I don't know what a fourth category would be. Maybe you guys would have some suggestions other than caffeine, creatine, and protein. What would be a category that has also many myths and misconceptions? Mm. Maybe fish oils. I mean, they're very, very common. Uh, yeah. But usually not as much concern surrounding them, I wouldn't think. I mean, I've seen some bad online stuff. Uh, you know, about it or I- ignorance, you know, like you said, Joy, like what is a steroid? Let's look at what a steroid is. And then I'll show you what creatine is not a steroid, yes, yes. you know, or like the thing I see with a lot with uh, fats is that all fats have pharmaceutical effects, nutraceutical effects. And so much so that it's even hard to choose a control group when you study dietary fats. You know, Joey, you know, my yeah. dissertation was on CLA. And that's when I first started looking at this, like, what do I even use for a control when all fats are like this, but then you get this, you know, sat fat bad, polyunsaturated yeah. fat good. That's a misconception. I mean, uh, of the polys, of the PUFA, 
oh my God, there's such a gigantic range. And <laughs> we overconsume the omega six, we underconsume the omega three. You know, this, that might be a fun one to look at. Actually, um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting you bring that up and um, the whole saturated fat thing where. And I've tried, here's the thing, and you know, you probably know the literature a lot better than I do, because when I start to read it, I go cross side. I'm like, okay, um, okay, what are, first of all, like, for instance, what are the markers of cardiovascular disease? Uh, I, I don't know. Is it LDL? Is it particle size? I don't know. I mean, you guys would know better than I. So when you're dealing with a saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat issue, I try to take the easy way out, and I tell people, look, I never open my refrigerator and say, God, I think I'm going to eat saturated fat today. Nobody does that, right? Um, we eat food. And because mm -hmm. we eat food, I might be eating a steak, which has some saturated fat. Maybe some of it is, is lipid neutral. But I'm eating that steak with maybe, you know, uh, half a cup of rice and maybe some asparagus. So I'm thinking, okay, well, there is saturated fat here, but there's all this other stuff too. So yeah, how, how do you – parse out the effects of all these different nutrients when you're eating a mixed meal. It, to me, it's not like creatine because we can, we look at, we have a lot of RCTs on creatine, a lot of RCTs on caffeine and RCTs on just protein supplementation. But the fat one, the, the issues regarding fat are just, to me, are so difficult to study that I'm not even sure how I would address like a, you know, common question and misconceptions with fat. That would be really tough. Yeah, it'd be controversial. It'd probably get a lot of attention. Like, like one of the consumer questions, because I appreciate that those pieces you're talking about are kind of, they're kind of consumer education pieces. Like there's a ton of literature. What do you need to know? You know, let's get some guidance from experienced PhDs and all this. But yeah, I mean, take home message is if somebody were to say, so is saturated fat bad? What a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, it would get a lot of attention, right? Because I think in the fitness world, people aren't afraid of saturated fat with the whole thing with it. And Mike, you know more about this stuff than I do the whole, you know, uh, keto movement and, you know, you yeah. are throwing coconut fat and everything and uh, <laughs> sat, sat fat in their coffee and stuff like that. And um, meanwhile, the traditional dietitian would be cringing. Right. And it's like, well, what does the data say? You know, you could get online and see ex respectable researchers talking about, well, odd chain sat fats like from dairy aren't as damaging. And here's why. And, you know, what a loaded question, but it's a good point, Joey. Like, I don't know. It would take an awful lot of the teacher side and the interpret for the consumer to even write yeah. an answer to is that that bad, you know, without yeah. that rabbit hole. Do you know anyone who could write that? <laughs> <laughs> don't put that on me. I don't know. Hey, Mike, I'll... you want to write a position paper? Oh. How about you, Mike? <laughs> no. And you'd have to even do the context, too. Are you talking about metabolically healthy athletes, or are you talking about the average unfortunate person who's not metabolically healthy? Right. Like, they have radically right. different effects. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. right. <laughs> That's why it's almost... It's like grabbing water. It's like, I, don't, I wouldn't yeah. know where to start. <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah. And it's a good point in the context of food. That comes up with protein, too. I mean, for years, I heard... I heard dietitians and other healthcare professionals say stuff like high protein diets are high saturated fat diets. High protein diets mm. are low fiber diets. So we actually mm -hmm. did some, we, we looked at a bunch of diet records and that wasn't the case at all, right? Because, with athletes, to Mike's point, right? Because they are going to do what Joey just described. They're, they're going to have a steak with asparagus or broccoli or something on the side. It's not going to be a Big Mac. We cannot conflate high protein diets with big mac diets yes a big mac diet is going to have quite a bit of protein from low quality greasy meats and you know blah 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 or trans fats and french fries or who knows but you can have a high protein diet that is not at all low fiber high junk fats etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah this stuff really depends population specificity that's one of the things I think we've all talked about in the classroom or even with athletes. It's like, here are some of the things. Phil over the years has said a hundred times, well, yeah, but that wasn't an athlete's, Lonnie. Absolutely. Like population specificity is a thing, right? From fitness status to dietary patterns to whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's just an ongoing consumer education thing, which is why those papers are good, I think, you know, about creatine and caffeine and protein or, you know, other things that are just often misconceptions. Yeah, well, I'm, I hope it helps, but like I said, I feel like, you know, it's the movie 300, and we're all at the 300, so. What a, what a great metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need help. We right. Need help. 
Here's all of us. Yeah, we're in the the hot we're hot gates, standing against the Persian army of <laughs> influencers. You know, I, one of my favorite things I thought about lately is influencer. We used to call that ignorant. <laughs> now we have a <laughs> now we have a name. Now we have a legitimate name for someone who's an influencer. They're like, well, I have no education. I have no background in this. I just want to share my experiences, and they're not thinking about how the misinformation that, that they spread is can be damaging as well. I'm not saying all influencers are bad. But yeah, by giving them a name like influencer, wow. like a positive thing, that's a risk because back in the day, the internet was called magazines or books, and we had editors. Yes. We had editors and you know gatekeepers, and now we we don't. Well, it's funny you bring up influencers because a lot of them have terminal degrees. So there, there are many good ones. There's no doubt. There are many good <laughs> yeah. ones. Yeah, and but there so, are many bad uh, ones, my man. Many I mean, bad ones. Right. Yeah, I mean, there was uh, one because what's funny, people start sending me this stuff. I'm like, wow, this is really funny. There was one that said might even been a medical doctor who said, you know, if you fast for seven days straight, your your I think risk of cancer drops by 70 percent. Something ridiculous. I'm like, yeah. huh, interesting. <laughs> I wonder how you came right. up with that. <laughs> yeah. But people love that stuff I'm like, oh, that's all I got to do. Fast for seven days. Oh, cool. I think I'll do it. So, you know, I tell them, hey, just work out and don't eat shit and try to get some sleep. I mean, that probably will. That's 99 percent of, you know, health. Um, yeah. But pe- people don't like simple. They want complicated because complicated sells. Simple doesn't sell, even though simple works. So it's, right. it's, it's yeah. annoying. Yeah. Skepticism doesn't sell. Simple doesn't sell. No. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. It's a lot of it's yellow journalism. It's a, it's a whole new other con- other topic that we've tried to wrestle with over the years yeah because clicks above all even if you say something stupid it's lots of clicks yes <laughs> but then i wonder do these people actually believe what they're saying i mean yeah it's just, it's weird. It's that's a good point I, I would guess the terminally degreed ones that you were talking about i think they know better and they're doing it it's it's almost more insidious because they're looking for the clicks um, yeah yeah, as opposed to the guys like, look at my abs and cardio stuff. <laughs> Never do any kind of anything aerobic. It's gonna. Yeah. Okay, listen. As much as I love muscle mass, and and I haven't done the, my, probably my fair share of <laughs> long distance running, I, I can tell you what you're saying is bunk. <laughs> aerobic exercise is not bad. It's not what's making you fat. Aerobic exercise <laughs> makes you fat. Oh my god. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, thanks for coming on, uh, Dr. Antonio. I appreciate it. No, this is fun. As I appreciate you guys' time. So, no, this is a lot of fun. Hopefully, you know, it'll change a few minds out there. That's that's the goal, I hope. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And speaking of which, um, next year, ISSN, uh, or anything else you want to share? Uh, yeah, next year, well, we have a, uh, the, our 21st annual conference is in, it's in Bonita Springs, Florida, which is, if you don't know Florida, it's on the west coast of Florida, um, near Fort Myers. So our conference is June 18 to 20, and um, that'll be a fun one. But also before that, I'm hosting a, a online webinar. It's called, I call it ISSN Rapid Fire Science because um, – Every talk is only 20 minutes long, which is kind of like my attention span. That's why I did it that way. <laughs> so, so that's uh, uh, that'll be March 23rd. So, um, so if anyone's interested in that, you know, you don't want to travel, listen to that. And also, I just want to plug the uh, podcast, um, uh, Sports Science Dudes. I do that with uh, Tony Ricci. He, um, he trains a lot of fighters, so we have a good rapport on that podcast. Uh, Mike will be on it later this uh, this well, later this I think in December. Yeah, December. Yep. Yeah, and Lonnie's already been on it. So um, yeah, we just try to get interesting people to talk about interesting stuff. I mean, um, and it's been a lot of fun. So hopefully that'll take off. Good, good stuff. All right. Okay, cool. Well, that's going to be it, everybody, for this week. We'll be back uh, <laughs> next week with our usual fare. We'll see you then. Until next week. Awesome. See you. Thanks, guys. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, 
you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.